Hello and welcome back to Patrick Boyle on Finance. Today we're going to talk about markets and trading from the point of view of the company Nikola, the controversial hydrogen electric truck maker. Nikola, the electric or hydrogen fuel cell truck company stock, became publicly listed in June 2020 through a SPAC or special purpose acquisition vehicle. This increasingly popular approach allows a company to list on a public exchange through a reverse merger, bypassing a lot of the expense and scrutiny associated with a traditional IPO. I might make a video at some point in the future explaining how SPACs actually work and how they don't necessarily reduce the cost of going public. Nikola's share price more than quadrupled since their listing, at one point exceeding Ford's market cap, with the idea that the company may follow in the footsteps of Tesla, despite having no planned sales until 2022. The goal for Nikola is to do for the commercial and consumer truck industry what Tesla has done for the automobile, using hydrogen fuel cells as opposed to batteries. A big difference between Nikola and Tesla is that Nikola have yet to produce a single vehicle and don't even have a factory built to begin vehicle construction. At Tesla's 2010 IPO, they had developed and sold over a thousand Tesla Roadsters. In 2016, Trevor Milton, the CEO of Nikola, announced that they would begin production on their semi-truck by 2019, with sales beginning in 2020. They began collecting pre-orders, bringing in billions in pre-orders with associated deposits. Now they say the first truck will be ready by 2024 at its earliest. While this isn't great, to a certain extent, it's kind of to be expected when there's sort of a complex or innovative technology involved. Now, when they showed their prototype back in 2016, Milton claimed, or at least strongly implied, that the vehicle could drive, but now it would appear that that was untrue. We will have a, a chain on the, on the seats to prevent people from coming in just for the safety. I don't want someone to end up doing something and driving this truck off the stage. In February of this year, Nikola announced that they would build a consumer-oriented pickup truck with the rather unfortunate name of the Badger. I guess at least they didn't call it the Beaver. Um, but anyhow, in came pre-orders to the tune of $10 billion. No truck has yet been shown other than digital renderings. While Tesla charged $100 as a deposit for the Cybertruck, which they had built a prototype of, Nikola charged $5,000 in deposit for a truck which it would appear exists only as a digital rendering. Earlier this month, Nikola agreed to partner with General Motors to build the Badger, using exclusively GM's technology, leading people to question whether they actually have any technology at all, or are they just a design and marketing firm rather than an engineering and auto manufacturing company. Two days after the deal was announced, a report from Hindenburg Research claimed to have extensive evidence that Nikola's proprietary technology was purchased from another company and raised questions about past businesses run by Nikola's founder Trevor Milton. Nikola has been accused of buying in parts that they claim to have built in-house and faking a video of one of their vehicles running, amongst other things. Amusingly, Nikola have admitted, and the press has widely reported, that a video of the truck operating was in fact the truck being rolled down a hill with the footage angle adjusted to make it look like it was driving up the hill. I'll put a link to Hindenburg's report in the description along with a uh, link to Nikola's rebuttal. And I'll note that it does amuse me once again that a company named after a hydrogen-filled blimp that exploded is short-selling and attempting to take down a hydrogen fuel cell company. So before diving into the fraud allegations, let's examine the details of the General Motors deal. GM and Nikola announced a strategic cooperation under which GM will gain a minority stake, roughly 11%, in Nikola in return for in-kind services, including the engineering and manufacturing of Nikola's electrified pickup trucks. 
The shares that GM will get were valued at around $2 billion as of the deal's announcement. According to Bloomberg, GM will retain 80% of the EV credits from the electric pickup sales and gets a right of first refusal on the remaining 20%. General Motors bears basically very little financial risk in this deal because the deal is an exchange of GM services for shares in Nikola and involved no cash payment for the Nikola shares. The worst thing that can really happen for GM is that they look a little bit foolish. So, so far we're seeing more controversy than clear innovation with Nikola. Nikola's cornerstone technology is the hydrogen fuel cell, supposedly a cheaper, more efficient, and more sustainable alternative to gasoline-powered engines and even electric batteries. One of the problems with this technology is that only 48 fuel cell recharging stations exist in the United States right now, 43 of which are in California. Nikola have built no stations themselves so far. According to Hindenburg, the director of hydrogen production and infrastructure to oversee this critical part of the business is Trevor Milton's brother, whose alleged prior experience largely consisted of pouring concrete driveways and doing subcontractor work on home renovations in Hawaii. Hindenburg also questioned how committed Trevor Milton is to the company. While it would appear that Elon Musk is all in on the businesses he has founded, Milton sold shares in Nikola, extracting around $70 million around the IPO, and amended his share lockup from one year to 180 days. Milton used some of the proceeds of this sale to buy a $32.5 million home, which is the largest home in Utah, presumably so that he can live it up like Dan Bilzerian. This is leading some to question the depth of his environmental concerns. Both the Department of Justice and the SEC have made inquiries to Nicola regarding these fraud claims. Nicola's response, which I've linked to below, did not really deny most of the accusations that came out of Hindenburg, and Hindenburg has since doubled down by saying that we view Nicola's response as a tacit admission of securities fraud. So what can we take away from this story? Some viewers have asked me if they should short Nicola stock or buy Nicola puts. My thoughts are that a highly innovative and highly volatile company is always a bit of a crazy bet for an investor, a moonshot. Hype stocks often fall flat on their faces and are often run by charismatic leaders who make over-the-top claims, but once in a while, one of them does go on to be a great success. In the late 1990s dot-com bubble, all sorts of companies claimed that they would harness the power of the internet to change the world. Most of those are long gone by now, but companies like Amazon and eBay went on to be great successes. Others like Google came after the bubble period, but were able to use some of the lessons learned to build world-leading businesses. It's worth noting that Amazon and eBay did have real running businesses and not just hype. While Nikola's shares have more than quadrupled after their listing, the debate rages on over how their business will evolve. If Nikola's vehicles were a sure thing and it was a sensible, safe investment with a good but boring business plan, analysts would have a much tighter consensus view of a reasonable valuation for the firm, and you would not expect to see wild price swings in its stock price. Most investors understand that any investment that can quickly quadruple can quickly quarter in price as well. Is Nikola's primary product hype? Yes, it is. And the same can be said for other companies like Tesla and investments in things like cryptocurrencies. These are just extremely volatile investments, and their prices don't relate to anything other than investors' exuberance. What does this mean from a quantitative finance point of view? Well, when asked if buying puts is a good idea, that's impossible to answer without looking first at how much the puts cost. When you first hear about options, they sound like amazing one-way bets, where if you bought one on a crazy underlying, you could make a fortune or lose a small amount of money. The problem is that you can buy puts on a stock, be right about the price falling, and still lose money on your puts. 
Why is that? Well, it's because the price of a put relates not just to the direction of the underlying, but it also relates to the volatility of the underlying or the implied volatility. Because a company like Nikola can easily half or double in price based upon some new news, people won't sell you a put or a call option for the same price that they would sell you one on a boring stock like Ford. And hopefully that's sort of obvious to you. Because you can always bet on the direction of a stock by just either buying or shorting the stock, most professionals just use options to bet on the volatility of the stock and then they hedge out the directional exposure. There's no reason to think that you'll make more money buying options on a really volatile stock than you would make buying options on a really boring stock. Options on boring companies just cost a lot less. They're a lot cheaper and a lot less of a move is then needed in order to make you money. You can compare this to the idea of a shop owner renting a store on a very busy high street versus a slightly quieter street. While they're likely have more foot traffic on the busy high street, their rent is also going to be considerably higher and they'll need to sell more goods in order just to cover the rent. I'm told that most of the stores on Bond Street in London actually lose money because of the high rent, but they're there in order to build prestige for the brand. And hopefully the idea is that they'll make the money lost at that store back through getting to charge higher prices elsewhere by being recognized as a premium brand. Renting a shop on a quieter, cheaper street means that you need to sell far fewer products to cover your rent. High rent often implies high foot traffic and the options market operates in a similar way. Options on volatile underlyings are more expensive and thus the underlying stock needs to move more for you to break even as an options buyer. Well, if buying puts may not profit from a fall in the stock price, should you just short the stock? The problem with that is that in order to short a stock, you first need to borrow the stock. People who own the stock will charge you to borrow it. You have to pay a certain amount, almost like an interest rate. And obviously controversial stocks like Nikola tend to be in high demand by short sellers. And as such, it can be expensive to borrow the shares. So suppose that you expect a dramatic drop in a stock price. If it costs you 18% a year in stock borrow costs to take a short position, and if the stock then only falls by 17%, once again, you were right about the direction, but you lost money because the price fell by less than you paid in stock borrow costs. So I'd like to finish up this video by asking if someone could explain to me in the comments section below why Nikola and Tesla have used Nikola Tesla, the inventor of the AC Motors name, for their companies. There was a famous rivalry between Edison and Tesla in the 1880s known as the War of the Currents over whose electrical system would power the world. Thomas Edison went so far as to secretly finance the first electric chair, running it on AC power in order to make the public fear alternating current. It's not obvious to me how happy Tesla would be to have these DC battery powered vehicles named after him. See you later. Bye.